All right, what is up, everybody? I am on with Gail Pru, Gail Vass Oxlade, the Gailster. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have a, a chat, open, open chat about money, personal finance, life, whatever comes up. Um, I, I wanted to catch up with Gail to see what she's been up to and uh, talk about some of the projects that she's working on, the stuff that's really blowing back her hair, get some opinions on financial literacy and money in general. And I actually have a few questions for you uh, on my Facebook page that some of my audience asked because uh, I mentioned that I was going to be having a chat with you today. So cool. um, let's talk about financial literacy uh, month in Canada. <laughs> you don't like asking me this question because you saw me go on the internet last night and on Twitter and do a yeah, rant. Yeah, and the last time we talked, that was what we talked about pretty much for the whole time was financial literacy week at that time. Um, anyway, I've got a few opinions about it. Why, like, um, this is Financial Literacy Month in Canada. You know, the, the government's uh, you know put this conference together. I did a little bit of googling to see what would come up when I typed in those keywords, uh, yes. and just to kind of set the tone. Uh, I found a page that came up on uh, number one result, which was a Facebook page. And take a guess how many likes it's got. How many people actually give a damn about Financial Literacy Month on Facebook, the number two traffic website in Canada? Twelve. Six <laughs> 662. Yeah. 662 so, people give a damn about it. So the thing is, is that... The reason why nobody cares about it is that we've been listening to people go blah, 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 blah for so long and nothing has happened, Richard. Nothing has happened. They struck commissions. They sent people across the country. They're still doing it. But nobody is actually putting a plan in place yeah. that people can see as a concrete roadmap to get them to where they need to be. And the thing is, is that it's all very well and good to deal with the knowledge aspect of financial literacy but financial literacy isn't just about knowing financial literacy is actually more about doing because do I really have to tell you that you should not be carrying a balance on your credit card do I really have to say you have to save some money or do people already know that and they're just not freaking doing it yeah you know what um, I was thinking this morning as I was, as I was driving in because I knew that we we're gonna hop on this call I was thinking we could start and end this call with one piece of advice as simple as spend less than what you earn and <laughs> save money every month and that's it and you're good. No, there are four. There are four. There are four. Oh, there's two more. Jump. There's spend less than you earn, save something. If you have debt, get it paid off Yeah. and mitigate your risks. Okay. Let's talk about mitigating your risks. Sure, Explain because that. what happens is a lot of people are doing almost everything right. You know, they've got some savings to the side. They're maybe participating in their company pension plan. Um, they're living on their income. They're not carrying any credit card debt, and then they lose their job, and they're screwed. Right. Because right. what are they going to do now? They're going to tap their retirement savings now. Yeah. Because I yes. wipe that out. They're going to they get sick. They get sick for three or four months. That's all it takes. And they're white. Yeah. And that's what I mean when I say mitigate your risk. You need an emergency fund. No, a line of credit doesn't count. And Credit cards don't count either. Have, uh, and you need to have some of the right kind of insurance in place just in case. Let's people talk about like insurance for a minute. Yeah. People like to think of insurance as some sort of ploy to rob you of your money. Okay. Okay. And I think to myself, okay, then don't insure. But then don't whine when your life falls down around your ears and you don't have any money to keep your roof over your head. What do you think about <laughs> insurance that's offered on like credit card insurance, job oh, loss insurance? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Go, talk to me about that. Because I have an opinion on that too. Yeah. First of all, if you buy credit or insurance, mortgage life insurance, you're not actually buying insurance. You're buying the idea of insurance mm. because the reality is, is that none of those plans are approved until you make a claim. And so you may have been paying premiums for a few months or a few years or a lot of years only to put a claim in to find out that, oh, no, you can't make a claim on this because you had a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not only that, but it's two to three times more expensive than buying term insurance. 
And so why do financial institutions get away with selling this product? And why does our financial literacy commissioner think that it's okay to rest financial literacy in the hands of someone who's so willing to steal from you? Yeah, well, they've got a vested interest in selling you those products. You know, they've run out of stuff to sell, so they go, I get notices, you know, a few times a year from, you know, the banks that I deal with, and they're always offering some new invented product because they're probably figuring out some way to return more value to shareholders. And the best one that came up recently was they were offering me uh, insurance on my line of credit which was zero, by the way, and has been zero forever. But they yes. wanted me to take on this policy for, I don't know, it was like 12 bucks a month. Yes. And the first thing that I start doing when I get stuff like that is I look at the fine print. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's where the details are at. And one of the things that it said was, uh, oh, yeah, we'll pay it out, provided that your average balance carried on, of your, on your line of credit is within 90% of what it's been for the last, uh, I think, 24 months. So let's take a scenario here. I have a house, I have a job, I need to put a new roof on my house, and uh, you know, roof tiles cost, I don't know, $9,000 to do my roof. All of a sudden, my line of credit balance has gone up by $9,000 during that term. Three months later, I lose my job, yeah. and I wanna make a claim to you know, carry on the payments. Are they gonna okay. cover me? Yep. No. Exactly. So, and this is the thing: is, is that people, first of all, they don't want to read the fine print because we have grown up as a society getting notifications on almost every web page we go to saying, "Read this, then say accept." Yeah. And you just want to get to what you're going to. Yeah. You don't really care, okay? Yeah. So you say accept, and people have come to see fine print that comes with financial products in much the same way. Just say accept because there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. You know, if you want it, you have to say yes. Yeah. And all it is is 12 bucks here, $8 there, $13 there, $18 here. It just adds up. And you think you're covered, but you're really hardly ever covered for anything. So one of the things that's part of the My Money, My Choices program is to find ways to reduce what you're spending. And I'm not asking people to reduce a lot by a lot. I say, you know, by the time you get to... Um, uh, level 10 you're supposed to decrease your debt by five have decreased your debt by five percent uh, decreased your spending by 0.5 percent okay and so at each level um, where you have to decrease your spending a little bit more then what you're doing is you're going back and looking at where your money is going and trimming so maybe you decide that the magazine subscriptions you've had for the last three years or the magazines you've just piled up in the corner, maybe they not worth all that much to you. Or maybe you decide that having premium cable, since you never watch TV anyway, is kind of a waste of money. Or maybe you decide that that huge data plan on your cell phone was great while you were on the road working, but now that you're no longer on the road working because you've got a different job, you should trim that back. Just really look at what goes out uh, by habit every single month and fix it. I'm going to put you in the hot seat right now and tell me what you've cut from your monthly expenses in the last year that's made a debt, that's made a difference. Um, I don't have to cut anything, Richard, because I have enough money. Uh, I'm going to go to my cash flow to look it up. Hold on. Because I have a cash flow budget. My property taxes and electricity and heat all went up. So did my house insurance. Oh, I know what I cut. I cut my kids. Probably. <laughs> they both graduated. Right. So this is the year last. My son has taken this year off to supposedly work. He still has to get a job, but he's to supposedly work. And then he's going to go to school in September. So his allowance went away. And my daughter moved to the city. So all her costs went away. Excellent. Oh yeah, mm. and I'll share a little uh, you know tidbit that I did. I I cut my cable about a year and a half ago, and I haven't missed it. I do not have cable. I have um, internet service to my house. I can yes. watch Netflix. Uh, yes. There's all kinds of streaming stuff that's available on the internet. It, you know, there's great yeah. content on YouTube if you want to learn something. Uh, and I haven't missed it. You know, the thing that no. really pissed me off about cable is I was paying to receive stuff on my TV. And then in an hour show, I would get 20 minutes of valuable content. The rest of it was marketers trying to prey on my weaknesses to sell me crap. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, well, interestingly, interestingly enough, enough, when Alex went to university, so this was five years ago, I cut the cable almost immediately. And it all came about because my box broke. And when I called them up and said, my box is broken, I need another box. And I was paying about $70 a month for cable. And um, they said, okay, but that's a $20 charge. And I said, are you kidding me? You're going to charge me $20 to reinstate my $70 a month service? And they said, well, those are the rules. And I said, then cut it. I don't need it anymore. And they tried to save me at that point. And I said, shut up. Go away. Okay, but the reality is, is that I don't watch television when the shows I want to watch are on anyway, because I'm in bed. Yeah. Right? So I now buy my TV, the stuff, the shows I actually want to watch, I buy them on iTunes and stream them through my Apple TV or I watch them on Netflix. Done. Problem solved. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about this financial literacy month thing. Um, I, was, I was looking at the government page uh, at who was, you know, going to be there and who the sponsors are. and. I don't think we need to talk about the sponsors because anybody can find out who they are and you know yep. learn, learn more about that. I didn't recognize anybody's face with the exception of Preet Banerjee yep. on that list of influencers in that area. And I actually did a search on Twitter with the hashtag FinantLitConf yep. and I was really disappointed in the people that were at the conference, the stuff they were talking about, the information, like, you know, here's a picture of our bankruptcy booth, come visit it. I don't care. Do, yes. do people struggling with money care? Like, why wasn't somebody like you there headlining the event? I mean, I think when people think about literacy, when it comes to money, they're going to think about the stuff that you've talked about and written about in your books, right? What are your thoughts on that? Unfortunately, I say things that are very controversial when it comes to all those sponsors that they have. Yeah, you're not very PC. So, well, <laughs> when I stand on the stage and I say, banks are money-making corporations, the people behind the counter are salespeople, and they lie. All the corporate sponsors that are financial institutions want to run screaming from the room. For a couple of years, I was ABC Canada, which is ABC Canada Literacy. I was their financial literacy spokesperson. And I retired from the job. Because everywhere I went, the TD Bank followed me. Mm. They had people in the room to make sure I didn't say anything that castigated because they were a sponsor of ABC Canada. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell the truth. And the fact is, is that you do boneheaded things to clients, and clients need to learn to stand up for themselves. And they don't all have my backbone. They also don't all have my understanding of just how much you're drilling me. Mm -hmm. It's funny because you look at the sponsor list and the sponsorship opportunities, a platinum sponsor is $35,000. So they're not going to want somebody on stage saying uh, financial institutions are going to sell you crap that you don't need. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Makes yeah. sense. All right. Um, let's move on. I want to um, talk about my money, my choices. So what's really blowing your hair back these days? I mean, you got actually, you know what, before we do that, why did you get out of TV? Uh, I left television because we came to a crossroads with the broadcaster where for years and years and years, I fought to keep the authenticity in the show. I fought to keep the reality in reality TV. I refused to create the story. It was always follow the story. So, for example, there was a day the production company called me up in a panic because we had given someone a challenge and they refused to do the challenge. And I said, did you get them saying they won't do the challenge on camera? Mm -hmm. And they said, yes. And I said, then we don't have a problem. That's actually the pushback. That's real TV. That makes for absolutely. But the production company was in an absolute panic because then we wouldn't have anything to check in on. And the show is so tightly formatted, everything has to be checked in on. Okay? And it, because it got worse and worse and worse. Unfortunately, uh, the people that I had worked with in the early years that were relatively smart all left leaving that stuff, stuff that tends to float to rise to the top. Mm -hmm. okay. And these were the people I was having to deal with. I, su I swear, Richard, I swear, when I told my executives at my broadcaster that I was doing a TED Talk, they looked at me like this and went, what, what does that mean? 
You can, you can only take so much stupid. stupid. Yeah. Okay. So when, so when they started interfering with the show in significant ways that I could no longer control, I retired from television. I couldn't just quit yeah. and do something else on television because I had an existing contract. Yeah. So if I work in television anywhere else, I will be breaching my contract. But I can retire, which is what I did. Good for you. All right, so let's talk about what's really blowing your hair back these days and you're excited about. You're doing My Money, My Choices. Um, yes. Why did you why did you set it up? What's it all about? Okay, so My Money, My Choices is a website, mymoneymychoices.com, that has a roadmap on it with a series of levels that you can complete. And as you complete each level, you uh, build the infrastructure for a strong financial life. So in level one, you have to do the most work. It's the hardest level, okay? And if you can get through level one, and the rest of it's cool breeze. But you have to have some tenacity and some gumption to get through level one because you have to do a spending analysis, you have to make a budget, you have to do a debt repayment plan, and you have to make your first net worth statement. And those things require some time and some effort and some introspection that lots of people don't want to do. If I know what I'm spending on coffee, then I have to admit to the fact that it's too much. So I don't even want to know. But if you are determined to take control, this is where you start. And, and you know, you know through, through the various levels, levels you are taken from, from um, the, very the very basics of cash flow management, management right, right through insurance, insurance estate planning, planning all, all the pieces, pieces that need to be in place for you to have a sound financial foundation. Is it an online course with a graduation? Like what are the components of it? Like is there an end goal? Well, ultimately, when you get to the end, when you get, first of all, there's no race. Okay, this is a life process. Being financially sound is not something you do this week, and then we're done. It's a lifestyle choice. So when, absolutely. So when you get to the final level, which is level 23, you will be making your maximum RSP contributions, TFSA contributions, eliminating. You'll have eliminated all your consumer debt. You'll be using your credit card and paying your balance in full every single month. You'll be mortgage free. You will eliminate your student debt and you have built an unregistered investment portfolio. So, in other words, you are rock solid. But it's not the achievement of level 23 that's important. It's being in the process that's important. Because, for instance, that first net worth statement that you do at level 1, you will repeat every 6 months. And, and in repeating it every six months, months the point is, is to measure your progress. Your progress. Because this, this is not about racing, racing to the end. end. Not everybody can, you know, get it all together by age of 37. So, you know, what we want to do is we want to be on the path. We want to be working towards the goal. Got it. And how long does it take the average person to achieve level 23? I have no idea. I expect most of their life. It took me until I was, I'm trying to think now, 50 Okay. to get there. Got it. And is there a cost for it? Is it free? Like, how does it work? It's free. free. And they would find it at mymoneymychoices.com. No, the thing is, is that what this is is a roadmap. It's what you have to do. It's not how you do it. But there are resources mentioned that you can use. Some of them are my books. Some of them are things on my website. If people come up with other resources that they want to give me, I will vet them and then decide if they're going to go up. So one of the problems I have, for example, with the financial literacy folk and the resources that they're offering is that some of them amount to ads. That is not a financial literacy resource. That is a marketing tool. Stop propositioning for its marketing tools as financial literacy resources, because it's not. Okay, so if people are going to send me stuff, they're going to have to send me stuff that doesn't have a particular agenda. Got it. Got it. All right. Um, I want to hop on to a question here. Actually, I got a couple questions for you because I uh, put this in front of my audience on our Facebook page of Total Debt Freedom to see if they had any questions for you today. And one came up that was interesting. It said, why does the Canadian government continue to allow places like Money Mart to exist? I know, uh, I know of men who cash their checks instead of paying child support payments. People avoid paying debt. And I've even heard of money laundering through these institutions. Uh, she, yes. You know, she goes on for a bit, but you get the general idea. Like, I'm not a fan of payday loan companies. Um, I've never used them. I like if you're borrowing, 
against your paycheck, that's like a sign basically to say, I need help. It's something that has to stop. That's, that's, that's really digging yourself in a deeper hole. But talk to me about that. What are your thoughts? Well, well the, the fact that she has asked the question, that's my Tabitha. She wants to have a conversation too. Um, the fact that she's asked the question, why does our government allow these organizations to exist? I don't have the right answer for that because I am appalled. I am appalled that they exist. Our usury laws indicate that they shouldn't be able to get away with charging between 700 and 1,000 percent when you add in all the fees, and yet they do. Didn't they pull back on didn't they pull back? Because, I mean, they, they have an advertised and posted rate of, I think, 23.5% on the websites now, right? Okay, but then they add in all the fees. So you have to add in all the fees. So, you know, it's a check cashing fee and the, uh, um, you have to put an application fee in. When you add in all the fees, it's horrendous. Got it. Got it. Yeah, so a uh, big piece of advice, stay away from payday loans. If you're if you're borrowing against your paycheck, that's that's nothing but a path to deep trouble. Well, and, you know, when people talk about things like um, child support being circumvented by using payday uh, companies, you know, that's morally reprehensible that we would have a way for people to get out of paying child support. Yeah, well, if they're going to legislate these these companies, um, there should be, uh, it should be prohibited that if you're, that if you're on the... Um, child support role and you've got those obligations, you're not allowed to use the services. They should not be allowed to cash checks for deadbeat dads. I mean, you know, it's it's as straightforward it, as that. It, it's even, it's worse, even than worse than that. They're, oh, they're not a mem- that. Yeah, it's yeah, if they're not a member of the uh, check casting association of Canada for all intents and purposes, which means that if um, I write a check to you today for services rendered, and then find out you gypped me and I cancel that check, I stop payment on that check, you can still take it to a money mark and cash it. They will cash it and then they will sue me for the money. And they will win. Interesting. And they will win. Interesting. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard. <laughs> I have another question for you. Okay. People in credit card debt, they tend to procrastinate. And I'm going to use an example with my own company itself because people go online, they look for help, they find us, they'll fill out a form that says this is their name and phone number, and we'll call them. And they'll say, yeah, I've got debt, I need a solution to it. We talk to them about the solution. And they've got, let's say, $40,000 in debt today. They're going to wait until it's 75000 before they call you back. Well, here's the thing. You know, we offer the solution. We, you know, we present it to them. We answer their questions. We might spend an hour or two on the phone walking through, you know, different scenarios and how it'll work. And then they sit on it. They don't do anything. They don't budge. And then three... <laughs> here's where it gets better now. Three or four years later, because, you know, I've been in business for 10 years. Now I've got a database. Three or four years later, we get another inquiry from the exact same person. Same name, same email address, same phone number. And on the drop down where it says, how much debt do you have? It's now $80,000. Why do you think people procrastinate on something as important as personal finance? Like this is, this is probably one of the most important things people need to get in life is how to manage money. Never mind algebra or, you know, on a balance of probabilities, if I'm in that room over there across the road, how many people will be between the ages of 18 and 24 and of an ethnic descent from Africa? Why, like, why is it that there isn't enough emphasis from us as a society, us as people? I mean, you talk to a lot of people, way more than I have ever. So I want to get your insight on this, but why do people procrastinate on debt? Okay, so when you look at the behavioral finance field and you look at just how whack we are, you realize that there are things driving our behavior that have nothing to do with reason whatsoever. Okay? The number one reason people will not do a spending analysis is they don't want to change their behavior. So if I do do this thing Gail's telling me about, this spending analysis analysis thing, and I find out that I am wasting 12% of my income on rubbish, am I prepared to stop doing that? Generally, the answer is no. I want to keep doing what I've always done. I just want a different outcome. I want to keep doing what I've always done, and I want the debt to go away by magic. Hold on a sec. I have a magic wand here somewhere. Let me get it. Yes, yes. 
I want to. This is way better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like, like, it, it's it, it just startles me. I mean, it frustrates me as an entrepreneur to see these people that that that, that carry this credit card debt that don't want it. Like, it's like you're on this merry-go-round, going round and round in circles, going nowhere. Well, the definition of insanity is doing the same freaking thing over and over again, expecting a, a different result. And they keep, you know, oh Absolutely. well, I'll just pay this, or maybe I can pay that, or I'll take a cash advance and pay it over here, and. You know, I'll see if I can win the lottery in five years. I don't know what the thinking is sometimes, but they just procrastinate. And there's got to be something missing. I mean, I don't know if it's an element of humanity, if it's something in the schooling system with finan like real financial literacy, like here's how money works, guys. Yes. yes. Well, the thing is, is that uh, you can't put it into schools because there's nowhere to put it into the high school curriculum. There's one spot, depending on the province you're in, um, and it's in, um, you could replace grade 10 careers with a financial literacy course, but nowhere else can you put it because nowhere else will you give up a required subject in order to get it into the curriculum because kids stream it so they get to take lots of different things right so that's the first thing so all those people are saying let's put it in the curriculum and all those schools that are saying they're putting it into the curriculum all they have to do is mention the word money in a line and they think they've addressed the financial literacy issue okay so we make this math sum a sum that includes dollars and cents and look we've put financial literacy into the curriculum I swear that's what they're doing Okay, it's not real learning. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we have to come to an understanding that um, how we behave is largely influenced by what we hold as important. So if what we hold as important is keeping up with the house that we see on television, that then we will go into debt to renovate our houses so that when our friends and family come over they all go ooh ah because they can see the marble and the granite and they can't see the debt isn't that what drives the economy though in Canada well that's what they would have us believe but the thing is, is that I don't actually think it's true I think that uh, if what we're doing is driving the economy on the backs of individuals who are sacrificing their own financial futures that eventually that has to come back and bite our economy in the ass because what are we going to do for all those retiring Canadians I mean I am the highest year of births in the Booba generation, in 1955, I am 55 years old now. What are they going to do when my cohort gets to 65, has paid off their mortgages, have taken on lines of credit and credit card debt, and don't have enough in retirement savings? At what point does our recovery? This is only 10 years down the road. This is not that far from Richard. Okay? What then does our economy do? I think we're heading for a bit of a train wreck. You know, I'll be honest with you. We've got um, we've got a huge demographic in our database, and our average client's 44 years old. Yes. Okay. Yes. And they have about thirty-seven thousand dollars in credit card debt. Uh, I think it's four point one cards. Last time I checked. So, people people in your boomer age that are going to be retiring, um, they're carrying the debt. I think they feel a moral obligation to the credit card companies. I think they feel like they have a right to earn 20% interest or 28.8% interest or whatever it is that they're paying because they gave me the credit card and I bought this stuff and I should pay it off and off they go. But I think you're right. I think we're probably heading for a, a bit of a train wreck in a few years when these people retire and they leave the workforce. Either that or they're going to stay in it and keep working because they haven't paid off their mortgage and they don't have retirement savings. But it's a bit of a mess. You're right. Well, and people will say things to me like, well, the credit card companies um, wouldn't give me this much credit if they knew they were going to have to take a write down. Right. Like, sure, of course. People are in the business of making money. You say that. They're in the business. And I say to them, they've made their money. What you put on that card, you've already paid for twice in terms of the payments you have made. So if they have to write off the rest, it's air they're writing up. It's not real money anymore. Yeah. Wow, we could go on for another half hour or so on this. Um, any last closing points? You know, nobody is really in responsible for getting the can opener out and opening up your skull and pouring in what you need to know to be financially literate. That is really your job and the resources exist. I know because I wrote a lot of them. 
okay? So you can't tell me you don't know how to get out of debt if you haven't read Debt Free Forever, because it tells you how to do it. It tells you how to make a budget. It tells you why you have to set goals and how important goals are. If you aren't going to do the things that will naturally take you to where you you say you want to be, then stop your whining about it, okay? Stop wringing your hands and saying, oh, you're worried, and because you're not. You're not really prepared to put in the effort. If you are prepared to put in the effort, go to mymoneymychoices.com, get on the journey, and figure out a plan, because everything is laid out there for you. Love it. Done. That's it. Gail has spoken. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you next time. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.